Hello, everyone. Um, so, first of all, thank you to the Bangladesh Centre and Berkeley for having us and enabling this vital com conversation to happen. So, I, I'll present my paper. It's kind of quite specific. It's um, on genocidal rape and analysis of tools and tactics to dehumanise a community. But I think it would only be fair to first introduce Rabia to you in her 60s. I met her on the first day she arrived into Bangladesh in 2017, the summer of 2017. Um, she witnessed her daughter-in-law being raped, um, her son being killed, and her father being killed, and sorry, her husband being killed. Since then, she was relocated three times from Shamlapur and then into Balukali, different areas of the camp, and is now currently, uh, sort of, I, I think, the best way to put it is she's receiving counselling in our women's safe space, but she's also struggling with dementia and, and, and other things. Um, so I guess it brings me to sort of the lens in which we can look at what, what I'm about to talk, uh, talk about, and it's, it's exactly what Dina said earlier about who is human and, and who should, should be supported. So throughout time, we've seen sexual violence, especially in the form of rape, being used to demoralize and destabilize entire com communities, destroying the structure of families and societies. In spaces of conflict, we cannot assume sexual violence is inevitable. When village elders are raped in public, sons are forced to rape their mothers, or soldiers rape the women in a village with their brothers and husbands forced to watch, the acts are strategic and are efforts to annihilate an entire community. According to the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to members of an ethnic, national or religious group and or deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of, calculate, conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part constitutes to genocide. This convention does not explicitly state that sexual violence or rape as a crime of genocide. We must only look to Rwanda when in church convents Tutsi nuns were made to dig their grave prior to being raped, killed and dumped into mass graves. Rape was used as a weapon and tool to destroy Tutsi women. This shrewd state-led military tactic is hard to prove and with no physical evidence compared to killing where there is a corpse, rape is often an invisible strategy. In addition to this, you have the stigma associated um, with rape, which means the majority of women will not report it. Rape victim suffering does not stop at the act of rape itself, as the shame of returning to their communities and being ostracized and made into pariahs by their own family, and often labeled, um, it, this is often labeled as a second rape. This stigma and shame often makes the investigation into politicized and militarized rape virtually impossible. Sexual violence is also used to obtain information, for example, as a method of torture in detention centers. It is also used to systematically attack the lineage of a group, for example, by impregnating or sterilizing women. These patterns can be seen in the case of Bosnia when two million women were displaced, and there was a mushrooming of detention camps, beatings, forced cannibalisms, <laughs> and gang rapes were commonplace. The RAM plan in 1991 outlined the use of rape on Muslim women and children as military policy. Again, we see the same vicious cycle in Bangladesh, as Apple mentioned earlier with the Birangana women, where in the space of nine months, almost 400,000 Bangladeshi women and girls were raped. Pakistani soldiers raided houses, raping women and girls, and then murdering them by spearing bayonets into their genitals. Mass rape camps were organized, and women were forced into sex slavery. In 1971, the government of Bangladesh declared women who had been raped to Birangana, meaning war heroine. Many of these women were marginalized and eventually committed suicide. Much like the women in Rwanda, Bosnia, and Bangladesh, the suffering of the Rohingya women in the hands of Burmese military and state is unimaginably barbaric. Rohingya men and women were brought into the paddy fields and separated. The army picked, according to one of our interviews, the most beautiful fair girls, um, was what an in, uh, one of the Rohingya that we met told us, um, to be taken away to either be raped or kept hostage as sex slaves for an individual soldier or groups. The rest were shot dead and dumped into mass graves. Our decade-long research at Restless Beings revealed that widespread sexual violence, many of which were inhumane in nature, including brutal rapes, gang rapes, and other forms of sexual violence using objects, often targeted, targeting girls and young women, were carried out to control and spread fear amongst village, villagers. Girls have been abducted, detained, and raped in military camps. Um, MSF, in their recent report, says more than half the girls it has treated after sexual assaults are 18 or under, including one girl who was nine years old and several others under the age of 10. They have shown fresh and deep bite marks on their faces and bodies. Their bodies have been mutilated. Many of the women and girls who were raped have since died from their injuries. Rohingya women in that sort of lens are doubly marginalized, having experienced systematic rape, abduction, and torture, and also seeing family members being killed. 
Forced to flee and in a continued state of displacement, women and girls make up just over 50% of the population in the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh, with one in six families being led by single mothers. Although they are now safer from the violence they faced in Burma, Rohingya women continue to struggle with many suffering silently in the camps. Restless Beings has interviewed countless women and girls in the last decade and gathered shocking testimonies of suffering ranging from being raped by the military to losing children as they cross the border. They are dealing with immense trauma which continues into the camps with many cases of sexual violence, child and forced marriages and trafficking of women and girls into sex work overseas. One of the women that I met, Shafika, so she's 28 years old, I met her on the winter of 2017. She was pregnant when she arrived in Bangladeshi soil, her family killed and village burned. She was then abducted alongside other women and gang raped by Burmese military. She has now given birth and struggling to accept her child and suffering from extreme levels of PTSD. Another case, Nuraya, a pensioner who was gang raped by soldiers who then took turns to urinate on her body. This was after watching her daughter-in-law also get raped and killed and her grandchildren burnt alive. <coughs> so with all its intersectionalities, genocidal rape must be seen for what it truly is, a tool and campaign for political control and attempts to weaken and wipe out communities. Although there are similarities between genocidal rape and the rape in war, both of which involves torture hum and humiliation, de it de degrades and demoralizes the other, a distinction must be made by the two. Genocidal rape comes with instruction. It is state sanction, it is systematic, and it is in order to destroy. Genocidal rape is collective sexual violence carried out on civilians by the state, political group, political group and or politicized ethnic group. The perpetrators are typically part of the state and victims are usually discriminated minority groups. This is strategic rape under state, state order and not uncontrolled rape that occurs in a conflict zone. These various faces of sexual violence are efforts to shatter a society, rapes to kill and which eventually also end up the, li the lives of victims from perpetual mental trauma and societal rejection. In the case of Muslim Rohingya women and girls who were deeply bound to their cultural and spiritual ideals of modesty, privacy and dignity, their bodies were used as vessels through which the Burmese military and state attacked the very <coughs> core of their being and identity. These women and girls were in the eyes of Burma, a mere object through which the destruction of the Rohingya community could take place. In the case of Rwanda, rape was used as a show of the ultimate disres disrespect towards Tutsi women. In the Bosnian genocide, rape was used to change the demography and the future of Bosnian population with forced impregnation by Serb soldiers. In the case of the Bangladeshi Birangona women, rape was used by Pakistani forces to mutilate bodies. In the case of the Rohingya, however, all three factors are present. Mass raping of individual women until the point of death, forced pregnancies, and mutilation were all present. Furthermore, in October 2016, Suu Kyi publicly, on behalf of the Tatmadaw, claimed rape reports as fake accounts. There was also a peak of rapes in August and September 2017, which tailed off by October 2017, despite violence and deaths continuing until this point. This proves the point that sexual violence was tactical and the deployment of rape was part of the design and implement implementation of genocide against the Rohingya. It is essential, therefore, to expand our understanding and acknowledgement of gendered violence as a vital instrument in perpetrating genocide. Ignoring sexual violence as a core tool of control and annihilation will lead to failure of any attempt to bring justice to the Rohingya community and the individual victims. As academics, activists, international criminal courts, we must all recognize and account for all the cases of sexual violence that are indi indicative of genocide. Failure to do so would further embolden the efforts made by Burma of genocidal, of genocidal denial. <coughs>